I don't know how the international system finally heals from the reality that one of the permanent members of the UN Security Council is a nuclear armed rogue state now. This is the thing that kind of keeps me up at night, that there is no real exit for Russia, even in the medium term. Even if Putin were to leave the scene tomorrow, there is a reckoning here. Welcome to G Zero World, I'm Ian Bremmer, and today we are looking back at the remarkable power shifts of 2022 and what it might mean for the year ahead. From the largest European land invasion since the Second World War, to the effective coronation of the world's most powerful person in Beijing, to a big political comeback for Democrats in Washington, it has been quite the year. And before we go dunk our heads collectively in one large eggnog bowl, sounds strange, let's talk about what it all might mean for 2023. And I'm joined by New America's Anne-Marie Slaughter, The Atlantic's Tom Nichols. But first, power is fleeting. Maybe history's oldest lesson from the rise and fall of the Roman Empire to the British Prime Minister who wilted faster than a head of lettuce. And when it came to three of the biggest global stories of the year, 2022 showed us just how quickly the sands of power can shift. Let's start with the war in Ukraine. In the early hours of February 24, it became clear that Putin's, quote, special military operation was going to be far more than a few precision strikes. A nuclear power, second in military might only to the United States, had launched the largest invasion on European soil since World War II. And you can understand why Ukrainian President Zelensky signed off on his call to European leaders the next day by saying, and I quote, this may be the last time you see me alive. Fast forward a few months, and not only is President Zelensky still with us, but he's welcoming the likes of Boris Johnson and Ben Stiller, I don't know who's more relevant these days, to the presidential palace in Kiev. His blue and yellow banded troops have inspired the world by repelling Russian forces throughout the country. And while the war is very far from over, Zelensky has the West, pretty much the whole West, on his side. A rejuvenated NATO is poised to welcome Sweden and Finland into its fold, and sanctions are crippling Russia's economy. Today, Ukraine's president is Time's Person of the Year, while Russia's president is a pariah, with world leaders literally edging away from him during photo shoots. At five foot seven, Putin was never a tall man, even in heels, but nearly a year into his disastrous war with Ukraine, he's never looked smaller. And then, there's China's President Xi Jinping, much bigger than Vladimir Putin. He cemented his status as the most powerful person on the planet this October when he accepted a historic third term as the General Secretary of the Communist Party. But he too is facing challenging times. China's zero COVID policy, meant to shield his nation from the pandemic, created ongoing lockdowns and sparked surprising protests. And earlier this month, the government announced a sudden rollback of those rules. But the damage may already be done. In October, youth unemployment stood at 18.7%. That's high. At a time that China's economy is slowing overall. Xi Jinping's government also faces ongoing global tensions over human rights abuses, including treatment of its Muslim Uyghur population. And finally, here in the United States, things weren't looking so good. For President Joe Biden, back in the run-up to the midterms, he went into November 8th with a blistering 41% favorability rating. Not good. And once in a generation levels of inflation. And yet, when the votes were counted, the Democrats defied history. Though they ceded the House majority to the Republicans, they managed to keep those losses to single digits. Very surprising. And on the Senate side, they held on to their majority it also is the first time since 1934 that the president's party had a net gain of governorships in a president's first midterm. None of this was good news for former President Trump. His hand-picked candidates grossly underperformed at the ballot box. Whether that's gonna kneecap his 2024 re-election bid, he's already running or not, far from clear. What will all this mean for the year ahead? I'm discussing that and more with New America's CEO, Anne-Marie Slaughter, and Tom Nichols, he's author and staff writer at The Atlantic. Here's our conversation. Anne-Marie Slaughter, Tom Nichols, 
Thanks so much for joining us on G Zero World. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I want to start with the war in Ukraine. Uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky has just been named Times Person of the Year. Uh, changed immensely how we think about the global order this war. Uh, Anne-Marie, start me off with your most unsparing take on what you think this invasion means for the world. This war has simultaneously dramatically sharpened the geopolitical great power politics are back view of what is wrong in the world. Uh, and at the same time, led us to focus a lot more on the global challenges of energy shortages, climate more broadly, food security. If you think about the Biden national security strategy issued in October, they said for the first time, these two sets of challenges are equal, equally important, and both of them are dramatically sharpened by the Ukraine war. I will say, I think longer term, this war will uh, mark a high point in the willingness of, of nations to stand up for the world of the UN Charter, but it will also be a turning point in where nations get their energy and will speed us to a green transition. Tom? I don't know how the international system finally heals from the reality that one of the permanent members of the UN Security Council is a nuclear armed rogue state now. Um, this is the thing that kind of keeps me up at night, that there is no real exit for Russia, even in the medium term, even if Putin were to leave the scene tomorrow, um, there is a reckoning. I don't agree with Tom that there's this dramatic change where suddenly one of the the, the great powers of one of the permanent members of the, of the Security Council is a nuclear rogue state. I, I agree that that may be the way the Europeans see it more than they ever have before, maybe the Americans. That is not true of the rest of the world. I, I really think ma many, many other nations in the world are looking at this war and saying this is a North war. This is an East-West war. It's not our war. And the biggest changes I see in the international system are all those countries. An Indian recently said to me that instead of talking about the global South, we should talk about the global majority. All those countries are demanding their place at the uh, global institutional table. And that means a lot of turbulence uh, in lots of different parts of the system. If the institutions hold, um, we will have no one to thank more than Vladimir Putin. Uh, this was, I mean, it, this is proof again that Vladimir Putin is a terrible strategist uh, because the Russians were getting what they wanted. Institutions were weakening. And suddenly, you know, 32 nations in NATO, including Finland and Sweden, the European Union actually acting like a transnational union that has a common interest. Uh, the Russians have created exactly the world they thought they were going to forestall. So R Russia's in a dramatically different position, uh, as Putin is, uh, going into 2023 as he was uh, going uh, into 2022. Uh, China, of course, also is looking a little different. H how do you think China and Xi are positioned globally as we look ahead to 2023? Start with you, Anne-Marie. I think it's going to be a rocky year for China. I really do. For one thing, the zero COVID policy fed on itself because uh, as people stayed locked down and they didn't get vaccinated and people will look back and say, why on earth didn't uh, the Chinese government with all its power simply insist on vaccinations, even with a less e effective vaccine? But once you've done that, you've got a population, of course, of over a billion people, including many, many old people who are not vaccinated. And so now we are going to see deaths. Uh, and the question is how how many, how fast? Uh, but that that will have its own fallout, both socially and economically for Xi. Uh, and in addition to just navigating the, the overall shift in policy, it is very striking that after, right after this Congress, where she is supposedly at the apex of his power, 
you see successful demonstrations, right? He is changing his policy. That means he thinks he can't just maintain it. It also means that notwithstanding probably the most repressive apparatus in the world, or certainly one of them, he couldn't stop these demonstrations, right? They went from city to city. There are small demonstrations that are local all the time in China. It's one of the ways, in fact, that the Chinese government lets Chinese blow off steam and figures out you know, how to adjust policy. But if you see anything like the deaths that we saw in the first four or five months of the pandemic, and it's not going to be possible to shut that information down. And at the very least, his, you know, infallible leader who is guiding China toward 2049, when it will become, you know, a, a middle income country and, and be recognized as the great power that it it has always deserved to be, that that narrative is going to be badly dented. And again, you're going to see economic fallout as well. So, Tom, how big a bump in the road? is this for China's uh, role on the global stage? What's really striking about this is how um, the Chinese regime has been revealed to be, has been cut down to size as just another government that has to deal with a bunch of problems that governments have to deal with, like a pandemic. Um, and there's even, uh, uh, to me, again, it feels like a little bit of a Cold War echo. If only they weren't using their own less effective vaccine. And the idea that the Chinese could just clamp down on dissent and could, um, you know, continue their role as an economic superpower and maintain all of that kind of facade of invulnerability, I think has really been, and I think that's frankly a good thing that that, that 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 facade has been kind of pulled down a bit. I'm sorry for the loss of life and the loss of productivity and all the other things that have happened from the pandemic. But I think we were we were kind of convincing ourselves of a narrative that the Chinese government could do almost anything. Uh, Anne Marie, uh, the other big conversation that's happening around China right now is to what extent there is and or there should be a level of economic decoupling uh, between the West and China, both on the national security side, but also in terms of more investment at home, more focus on domestic workforces, all of these things, very different than the globalization arguments, of course, that dominated the global economic conversations for so many decades. How do you feel about this in the China context? There has been some decoupling and there will undoubtedly be more, but it, it it has to be limited. I think it will be limited simply because uh, for for whatever is happening to China and Chinese growth this year, it has still been the fastest growing economy, the 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 you know hundred pound gorilla or eight hundred pound gorilla on the glo on the global stage in the last twenty years. And so we're shifting things to Vietnam. We're shifting manufacturing back home. Some degree of that, absolutely. The pandemic showed us that we were too dependent. But I can I look around at U.S. business and global business. I look at the European Union and the, and the again, you're, the EU is China's greatest trading partner. We are not moving to anything remotely like not only full decoupling, even 50% decoupling. I think you're looking at 10 or 15%. That still, you know, has an impact given how big the numbers are, but I think it's worth remembering China is far better governed than either Russia or Iran, right? China really has delivered a far better standard of living for its people. The Chinese government is broadly supported. There is absolutely dissent, but I think it, it is not, it, it doesn't make sense to compare it to Iran and Russia, given economic policy, social policy, even health policy, even with all, all these difficulties. Uh, so overall, China's a force. We have to continue to engage with them. And then going back to where we started on the global challenges, right? So food security, energy security, water, climate change, pandemics, if there's another pandemic and there will be, we have to work with China because without China, we we really don't have a chance of addressing these really big global threats. One more big topic, gotta get to the United States. I wanna ask Tom, uh, given what we just saw from the midterms, uh, were people too overexcited about uh, how much trouble American democracy is in? Oh no, I think we're still completely underestimating how much danger American democracy is in. Um, you know, we had a narrow escape 
um, had um, some small margins gone the other way, we would be in a world of trouble right now. I mean, do the counterfactual in your in your mind of election deniers and various other kind of kooks and weirdos taking over state offices. Because I think one problem is we still concentrate too much on the big picture of who's the president, who controls the Senate. But when you look at things like secretary of state, um, state legislative chambers, governorships and so on, um, we we had a narrow escape and it's not it's not done. I mean, they're all coming back for another bite of the apple uh, in 2024. So the idea that we that, you know, that we're somehow overestimating threat to democracy, if anything, I think we are way too complacent. So, no, I, I don't think democracy is out of the woods here in the United States by a long shot. Anne-Marie. Well, I agree in many ways. Uh, you know, if you look at these margins, so Ralph Warnock won, you know, by 1%. These are tiny, tiny margins. And I think it's only a turning point depending, and I agree with Tom, uh, on people continuing to perceive that democracy really is at risk. At the same time, to me, probably the most important part of the midterms is not Democrat versus Republican, but Republican versus Republican. It's the rise of DeSantis against Trump uh, that is is critical, I think, to ultimately isolating the Trump wing of the Democratic Party. And, and DeSantis is actually proving that you can pursue Trump policies, but without Trump's willingness to just trash the system completely. Long term, there's still a danger there, but for my money, it's very important to rule out the the most extreme, the people who are willing, exactly as Tom said, to simply stand against the Constitution and to claim that their views are more important uh, than our democracy. And that's that split within the Republican Party that that I think we will see uh, evolve in very important ways over the next two years. So final question. Um, because we're, we've been picking on the GOP side here. I want to ask Anne-Marie if Joe Biden comes to you right now and says, Anne-Marie, do you think I should run again? What do you tell him? Right this minute, I'd say yes. You would what? I would actually say yes, because, because I think he's accomplished a lot, because he is in fact he was was able for many many reasons this wasn't love of biden but he had delivered some real legislative achievements now look his health his his sort of fitness that's a matter for him and his family to decide uh, and his doctors but but there's no sign right now that that he really can't do it uh and i actually i look at this 2 years in uh and i think He's done a lot of very important stuff. Uh, and that actually is, I think, the strongest platform to run on right now. OK, Tom, uh, Biden's your your gladiator, your Caesar. Give me the thumb. <laughs> I'm, I'm with I'm with Anne Marie on this. I'm amazed. My that this, goodness. I, I'm, I'm amazed that this is even a question, because if you just if you took Biden's kind of old guy, you know, ambiance out of this and said, here is the record of a first term president with all of these legislative achievements, holding NATO together during a major European land war, um, you know, escorting the economy out of the doldrums. Looks like we're starting to tame inflation on and on and on. And and a first term president with his party in the majority not only completely limits the gains in the House, but actually gain seats in the Senate, there would be nobody saying, you know what that guy ought to do? He needs to step down. No one would yeah, say yeah. that. It's purely a matter of because he's old. And yet Donald Trump is within a few years of Joe Biden's age. Just a joke. We're so used to Joe Biden back in his day being that, you know, sort of parody of himself that now, you know, he's a, he's a 79 year old guy and everybody says, yeah, he's lost the step. Now, you know, the problem we have, Tom, is that the older you get, the younger those people look to you. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Tom Nichols and Marie Slaughter, always great to see you. Glad to bring you together on television for the first time. It was great, it was great. fun. Thank you. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, or even if you don't, but you want to just reprise 2022 over and over and over and over again, you can take a minute 
to sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal.